Well, as the, as the Stanford, the first Stanford representative here, let me be the first to officially welcome you to Palo Alto, to Stanford, to the law school, and to Stanford University. I want to thank uh, both Judy and William for allowing us to participate and giving us this opportunity to work in tandem with them on this summit. Uh, a summit on the future of legal services and particularly access to justice is uh, near and dear to Stanford Law School's heart and near and dear to Stanford University's heart. Uh, William was speaking about the earth moving under our feet. This region of the country, uh, <laughs> the earth does move under our feet uh, in, in, in sometimes negative ways, uh, but in many ways, uh, positive ways when you think about the technological revolution that this region of the country helped lead. And so a summit on innovation and change and what that means for the future and what possibilities that kind of innovation holds for expanding access to justice. It's just a great and terrific opportunity for Stanford Law School to be a part of a summit on that topic. I also want to uh, say another reason why we think it's a great opportunity for Stanford is to see the leadership of William and Judy. Uh, the, the profession sometimes gets the reputation as being very resistant to change. I think these are two individuals who are demonstrating this is a profession that is leading in thinking about change and taking, uh, taking a leadership role in both mapping the landscape of what's happening and predicting what might possibly happen in the future to embrace that change and embrace all the opportunities of that possible change. So that's a, a wonderful opportunity for the law school. Let me, I think my job really is to be brief because I'm keeping you now from Judge Fogel and Justice Cuellar, which I do not want to do anymore. Let me, let me recognize in addition uh, to Judy and William, the co-chairs of this conference, uh, Judge Fogel, who is going to lead the conversation with Justice Cuellar, and Professor Deborah Rohde of the Law School, who along with Lucy Rica of the Law School have uh, really carried the, the weight of co-sponsoring this conference. Deborah, I know you're here. Where are you, Deborah? There is Deborah. There is Deborah. So we are just delighted that you're here at Stanford. I will tell you this is, um, to locals, this is viewed to be a beastly hot day and deeply unacceptable uh, because there's about a seven degree range uh, that is acceptable weather right here. So hopefully tomorrow will be more appropriately temperate for you. But we are very happy you're here and delighted to be a part of this. Let me turn it over to Judge Fogel and Justice Cuellar. Okay, well thank you very much. Um, let me introduce myself uh, very briefly and then I'll introduce uh, Justice Cuellar. Um, my name is Jeremy Fogel. I am um, actually from this area. Uh, I began my legal career here uh, as a legal services lawyer. I represented people with mental illnesses and uh, uh, other uh, things that impaired communication and being able to work with the legal system. So this whole area of of access and serving underserved populations is in my blood from way back. Uh, I was a judge on the state court here for 17 years, uh, then on the district court, the federal district court, for about the same length of time. Um, three and a half years ago, uh, I was appointed as the director of the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., which is the uh, agency that educates uh, federal judges and court staff and also does policy research for the federal judiciary. So it's an interesting uh, combination of things. Um, I just want to say what a privilege it has been to be a member of the Commission and to work with these wonderful people that we've had a chance to work with. And I'll say more about that tomorrow, but I, I did want to say that tonight. Um, I want to um, introduce somebody. Um, some of you know him, probably a lot of you know him, but he's one of the most remarkable people I know. And I think it's particularly uh, appropriate that he's here because his life exemplifies a lot of what this summit is about. Uh, his life is about overcoming barriers and uh, thinking very broadly and big and being a leader in innovation. Um, he has all of those qualities uh, in, in enormous uh, abundance. He's also a brilliant person and at the same time a very humble and compassionate person. Uh, Tino Cuellar was born in northern Mexico. Um, in, he lived in, when he was young in Matamoros, Mexico. Um, he walked to school across the border. That's part of his uh, history. 
eventually his family moved to Calexico, which is in, in Southern California, also on the border, and he became a naturalized citizen. Uh, and then went on to earn degrees from Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. Uh, he's been an advisor to two presidents uh, in a variety of areas. He's been an administrator in this very building. Uh, the the uh, institute that is part of one of the main tenants of this building was one that he uh, directed until he moved on to other things. Uh, he's on the uh, board of a number of nonprofits, uh, big ones. Um, and then last year, uh, just because he hadn't done enough in his life, he was appointed to the California Supreme Court uh, as an associate justice, um, and he was confirmed by the voters uh, in the November election. Uh, and just not to leave out the most important thing, he has an absolutely wonderful family, and he's a great parent and, and spouse. Um, so, um, you know, I could talk about Tino all night, but then we wouldn't have any time to talk about innovation. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and the other thing which really uh, I can't resist saying is he's just a dear friend, uh, Tino Cuellar. <laughs> so we, we're going to do a, a sort of an interview uh, format, um, and um, I'm going to throw up some softballs, and Tino's going to hit them out of the park. Uh, <laughs> But uh, hopefully it'll be an illuminating um, uh, conversation. And I think maybe where we can start is a very general one. Just kind of where, where is the legal profession now, as you see it, from all these different angles that you've been able to see it from? Um, you know, um, law school enrollments are down. Um, um, people can't get jobs. Uh, there are lawyers for the very rich and the very poor, but no one in between. Where, where, where are we as a profession? Thank you, Judge Fogel, and let me start by saying that that very kind introduction deserves a rebuttal. I'm not going to do it now, but I'll do it later. I, I'm, I'm very touched, and, and I will say that my uh, anticipation of this event has sort of gone from a level of comfort and security and then to a concern, first because I realized that Judge Fogel would be the one up on stage with me, so I thought, how bad can it be? And then I learned a little bit about how extraordinary the audience was going to be, and that was pretty intimidating. At that point, I decided maybe I wanted to go into the witness protection program. <laughs> so uh, if that can be arranged over the course of the next few minutes, maybe I'll have to say goodbye. Before I go any further, I also have to acknowledge and thank the amazing leadership that has come together to make this event happen. How exciting and encouraging. There are so many problems with the world, with the legal profession. We'll talk about some. But I'm encouraged by the fact that this kind of event highlights the possibilities, the foundation we have to build on, the incredible things that are going on, the good ideas that we can seize. And I'm just thrilled and honored and humbled to be a part of that. Last but not least, I do have to thank my daughter, Ria, who's turning 11 today and is having a birthday party about three miles away from here. She gave me a hall pass to be absent for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and, uh, she looked straight into my eyes just as I left and said, dude, and you know it's bad when your daughter tells, calls you dude, right? You better be back here in you know, an hour and a half. So I'm grateful to Ria. So this building is an interesting building because it used to be a dorm. And uh, right here is where John Steinbeck lived and where Herbert Hoover lived. A couple floors up is pretty much the space where Herbert Hoover occupied when he was a student from kind of an out of the way place. He came to what was then a pretty new university was full of excitement. And it was fairly often when I would be walking around this building where I spent a lot of time before going onto the court, when I'd ask myself, what would Herbert Hoover think? I mean, simply because he used to live here, uh, about the world if he were back here, if he were looking around. He was a smart man, he was ambitious. He was a core and engineer, like many people who come to Stanford and run Silicon Valley. But there were two things that were very important in his life that I think are key to any effort to understanding the legal profession. And these are just some thoughts that I want to brainstorm with you about because you have your own ideas and I want to hear them. His life was marked by an engagement with industry and business and technology. What was then technology? He worried about mining, how you got minerals out of the earth, but also globalization. This was the man who basically thought through how the US would engage with the incredible human misery following World War I and then again actually in World War II and played a key role in delivering relief. So he thought about train schedules, he thought about punch, well not punch cards exactly, but about timetables, about how you could take mathematical formulas to figure out how to organize people and materials. 
And I got to say, I think it's interesting then to juxtapose that with 21st century law practice because it, it will not surprise you that I'm one of many, many people who think that we are in the midst of a moment of incredible opportunity, but also dislocation as we try to marry up in a way, some traditions that the legal profession is a trustee of, that we are all as lawyers trustees of, a sense of service to your client, a sense of humanity, of due process, of justice, along with powerful forces that no individual controls. Forces that go under different labels, but I'll just use two convenient ones, globalization and technology. Globalization, you pick up the phone and let's not even talk legal service, let's just talk like you call United Airlines or Hilton Hotels because you want to change something about your travel plans and you're talking to somebody in the Philippines. And they take classes maybe to make it a little harder for you to tell that you're talking to someone from the Philippines, but you can tell sometimes. Uh, and then meanwhile, technology. Well, I'll just mention one event that happened, not in this building, but about 30 meters from where we are across the way at the Hoover Institution. One of the captains of industry from here in Silicon Valley, if they call themselves that, maybe they call themselves something different, but he was just holding court, uh, being interviewed, much the way I am, and talked a little bit about what he expected to see in six years. And, uh, you know, I'll stay fairly general, but he said essentially, what I imagine is an app that will learn. You will write some emails, and the app will figure out how you sound. The app will figure out who you want to brush off with a sort of polite email when you really don't feel that and you want to say that you want to meet with them but you really don't. And the app will know who you actually want to hang out with and spend time with. Over time, not long, the app will figure out you know, how you will want to write to your wife, perhaps. It'll let you answer questions more quickly and you'll be able to talk to the app and you won't even have to much because the app will talk to you and will give you a sense of how you want to spend your day. And then he said, I think that is on the horizon, will be here in about six years. And so the audience was, had an interesting reaction because about half the people in the audience kind of gasped a little bit. And about the other half of the audience started debating whether they thought the prediction was just a little too optimistic or not optimistic enough. The engineers in the room, the computer scientists, they started talking about just what the algorithm would actually have to look like and how long the period of latency would be of the software reading your emails before it could sort of pick up and write for you. And I'll just sort of end this sort of long, slightly rambling introduction by saying what I think is really interesting about these two forces and asking how will they affect our profession is that we have two resources in the world that we generate as lawyers. And one of them, I'm sure, is scarce. I'm not sure if the other one is, but it might well be. And both are likely to be affected by these changes. What is for sure scarce is our time like how you can slice up the pie that is your day. And this is a two-edged sword when you think about that relative to technology in particular because it cuts both ways. In some respects, the companies that develop the software will be telling you, because your time is so precious, turn over some decisions, how you write an email to a client, to the software. But it's also true that that very same technology is competing fiercely for your time. Not just the ads, but also the different and new ways of using machines to talk to more people, to do more things, to have more of your work done in a different way and so on. I am sure that our time is scarce. I'm not sure that our loyalty is scarce, but I will highlight that our profession is, um, it exists within layers and layers of loyalty relationships to the nation state, to our state, to the legal system, to our clients, to the bar, to you know, the judicial officers we appear before. And I, this I'm, I'm less certain of, but I'll just put it out there for conversation. Amidst all the potential and excitement of all these changes, I sense also a kind of weakening of those bonds of loyalty and, and think that part of it is driven by a sense of, well, okay, we're in different jurisdictions. We have clients across borders. We have you know, all these demands on our time. Uh, you know, I had a student who grew up in Italy then his diplomat parents went to Philadelphia for a while to be the Italian consuls there. He then went to Wharton and came to Stanford Law School and then was clerking for a judge in Arizona. And when I asked him the question of where he wanted to live and whether he missed Europe, he, he said to me three times, I just don't understand your question. I will go where the job is. And I have to tell you, I think in some ways that's a terrific thing, but it also raises all those questions. Well, and so what it sounds to me like you're saying is, in a way, one of the things that technology 
could do if we don't watch out is it could commoditize what we do. Yes. And, and that's something we've got to think about. Yes. And to say just a little more about that, yeah. how and how much, I think these are precisely the questions that our president just raised and, and are at the heart of what I hope that this group will deliberate about. And, and let me highlight one thing in particular, because if you're in Silicon Valley, it's hard for you not to think that the world is partly driven by what consumers will buy. And, uh, and you know, there have to be limits on that. But, but the key is not only what is technology capable of doing, but also what are the people going to be satisfied with? In other words, you could make a really compelling argument that the software, not just seven years from now, but 14 years from now, despite the incredible feats of uh, communication and analysis it can do, it can't do what a human lawyer can do. But that's only half the question. The other half of the question is, is the audience for that going to say, well, OK, get that delta of difference is something that matters to me. And I, I want to engage with a human in this way. Mm -hmm. So with that context, um, what, what do you think are the most significant unmet needs that we face? There's so many. I, almost, right. I honestly don't trust myself to answer the question. Uh -huh. So instead, what I'll tell you is some unmet needs that I see out there, okay. but there are many more. And, and this is something that like, you all would have really interesting answers to this question. Mm -hmm. Sitting here in California, it is hard not to suddenly think about language. Let's just start with that, which is an issue I've been drawn into early in my time in the judiciary. So if you add up all the people in Texas who don't speak English very well, and all the people in Florida who don't speak English very well, that's about the number we have in California. And that's a, that number is about 7.5 million. And Spanish comes to mind as one language, but you've got like Tagalog, Vietnamese, Korean, various flavors of Chinese, uh, Central American languages. And these are folks who are often disproportionately interacting with the criminal justice system. So the way we meet their needs is like not great, uh, to put it technically. Um, how, <laughs> how do we do it? Well, okay, we have hardworking interpreters who show up in criminal cases and in traffic court. How well do we do it on the civil side? Well, historically, California has provided no interpreters in that situation. That is now beginning to change. But you can imagine how whatever else you say about the level of need in that community, if you've got a family law case and you've got two people who don't speak English and they've got a kid that shows up to that proceeding, it is the worst thing, the most heartbreaking thing in the world to see the parents duking it out, stumbling through English, and the kid ending up in a sort of default translator role. But I could go on. Let me just mention yeah. two other areas. So in addition to language access, you've got family law itself, where 80% of the litigants here in California are not represented. Then you've got landlord tenant and housing type stuff, which comes to mind as one example of where you have really asymmetrical dynamics, mm -hmm. where 90% of the landlords are represented, and about 85 to 90% of the tenants are not. So those come to mind. But you know, even outside the context of legal services for the poor, there are a lot of other unmet needs. Mm -hmm. What are a couple, just, just in a, for the, for say, middle class clients? Well, I think that the, um, okay, so here, uh, there, there are many things about my job I'm learning. Mm -hmm. One is like how to talk when an issue is like possible for me to talk about, but it does touch on some things that, mm -hmm. you know, could come before me or come before mm -hmm. me. But let's just say for a lot of people who are in um, some relationship with uh, large organizations, private sector organizations and their customers and they're dealing with some legal problem that arises, perceived or actual, because they don't get what they hoped they would get. That brings up the issue of alternative dispute resolution, which has its own special dynamics. And I'll just stay general about that. But I think the whole question of how do you deal with folks who have not the kind of legal need that can engage uh, a very sophisticated part of our bar in resolving a business need, but are also not at the point where they are meeting a need that is constitutional, or they're facing a need that is constitutionally required to be provided. Mm -hmm. So the universe of like civil Gideon stuff involving mm -hmm. civil confinement, involving civil contempt, involving uh, you know fairly routine interactions with medium-sized businesses, I think there's a lot more that could be done there. Right. Okay. So um, in this meeting here is to try to think about some strategies, some approaches, uh, ways that we can start to, to attack some of these issues. What, what are some general 
things you've thought about as, as guidelines or principles we could apply. I do wonder about the role of the courts, uh, especially because of where I'm sitting now, and how, to the extent that state courts have a role to play, and this does vary state by state a little bit, in the rules that govern practice and the relationship to the bar associations, in whether there are some smart, careful, sort of scalpel-oriented ways that you can tweak rules so that maybe folks who are otherwise not licensed to practice in a jurisdiction but have some tie to the jurisdiction, maybe because they're in a law firm headquartered in a place, can do something to help meet the very big chunk of unmet needs that require pro bono. I've, I've watched with interest, but I'm very curious what this audience would say about folks in the finance world, like the hedge fund world, now to go to another extreme, that are getting into funding uh, legal action mm -hmm. because they think that there might be some room to bring some kind of consumer action of some kind, but the funding for it really can't come together unless there's a novel funding mechanism. I think that all of us who care both about providing more legal services effectively, but also recognize that technology is not a panacea, have some hard work to do to thread the needle there. I'll just go back to language access to mention one one example of how this is playing out in some states and how we have to look at this seriously in California. So if you've got a big state like California and you have some Vietnamese speaker in Shasta County, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from here, that gets picked up because of some theft, there are not a lot of Vietnamese interpreters in Shasta County. There are a whole bunch of them in LA County. So uh, how can we use video to solve that problem and to do it right away? And by the way, there are a lot of reasons to do that. One is because you can get an arraignment done more quickly in Shasta County. But another is because the way we currently deal with interpreters is we fund them in half day or quarter day increments. So if we don't solve it the way I just described, you might have to have an interpreter get in a car, drive from LA to Shasta County, do the 10 minutes and drive back. And I think we can do better. So you're talking about using technology in that way, the Correct. courts using technology to make services more accessible. You're talking about looking at regulation. What about the training of lawyers? You were a law professor for, for a number of years. Um, should we change the way we train lawyers? I think we have some great folks in the room to think that through, but I'll just offer an idea or two. I think lawyers have to learn a lot about technology. Mm -hmm. The typical lawyer, and about globalization too, you know, and I think law schools are in many ways, including ours here in, at Stanford, are moving very effectively to take on the globalization piece. There's a really neat class that's being taught that Dean McGill helped get off the ground on basically going global and thinking about how law practice plays out in other parts of the world. And I actually think that's not irrelevant to even the legal services needs too, because you're not just talking about language barriers in some cases, you're talking about different cultural conventions, different ideas about authority. If you're gonna be a private sector lawyer doing some high quality pro bono work on issues like refugees and asylum, having some sense of global dynamics is important. But the technology piece is huge. And here I think that there are some skill sets that really take deep knowledge about the law and about technology together and the number of places where that intersection arises and where you need both kinds of knowledge is growing. Just to mention two examples, if you're trying to figure out this video technology thing and do process, it actually helps to know a little bit about how the internet physically is set up, like the pipes of it, like mm -hmm. what makes it likely that you might have a glitch going on and why it's just not enough to say, oh, well, you know, FaceTime will solve that problem. Mm -hmm. But even more to the point, as uh, legal services get reorganized and in some cases outsourced and folks go beyond e-discovery to think about software that can help you automate some legal work, then you know, it's helpful for somebody to understand how an algorithm is put together, like what the weaknesses and blind spots are of software that ultimately is relying on sort of polynomial type analysis, like a kind of mathematical functioning that doesn't quite replicate the human brain. Mm -hmm. And I think it'd be kind of really neat to ask, how can we make it so that a very large proportion of law school graduates have some pretty basic and comfortable familiarity with it? They that? understand what went into the, the black box in a way. Exactly, yeah, so yeah, that yeah. not all of them are yeah. gonna actually be coding, but so they can be, at a minimum, the kind of smart consumers and discerning uh, you know, folks who will push back on code 
the way I think we've already seen with respect to basic economics, basic statistics, you know, I would argue that psychology is just as important. I'm going there. That's Gotta right. understand, yeah. and you're an expert in this, but <laughs> we're gonna understand machines, we might as well understand people too. Right. But, uh, and we have a ways to go there. <laughs> well, to that point, since you brought it up, and I was gonna ask you about it anyway, go back to the commoditization fear that you, you articulated earlier. What about people skills? What about lawyers? One, one of the things you hear about lawyers from clients is that lawyers are not very good listeners. The lawyers don't communicate a sense of caring about me. You know, that's one of the complaints that you'll, you'll get. Um, and as things get more commoditized, you get farther and farther away from that. I see a problem with some lawyers not being good listeners. I would hesitate to say that it's anything inherent in our profession or in how we train folks. Probably there's a little bit of a selection effect that some folks who make stellar litigators or, and not just to point at litigators, but uh, yes, like, okay, well, I think, and judges probably mm -hmm. could learn that. Oh, yeah. The same. <laughs> working on, working on uh, that. I would agree. <laughs> I, but, you know, so what is one good yeah. thing about yeah. technology getting to the point where the typical person, maybe seven years from now, might be in a, at least a textual interaction with something coming through a machine and not easily be able to tell whether it's a person or not? Well, one good thing is I think that's a competitive pressure that will encourage folks in service-oriented professions to actually be better listeners. Mm -hmm. Because if we can be, and if part of what lets us be terrific listeners is a mix of empathy and analysis that I would argue is deeply human, then we've got to show that. Okay. So um, have you seen anything in, in any of your various professions that you think is a good example for others to look to, that's a good inspiration? Uh, Yes, in a way, but I'm actually wondering as I think this out loud as a, whether this is actually a, an encouraging example or not. Because I think about architecture. Mm -hmm. the, I think this building is, is the most beautiful old building at Stanford. That's just my quirky view since I used to work in this building a lot. But another gorgeous building is the building that is currently the heart of Stanford Law School. And it's a, if you haven't seen it, you should walk around there. Uh, you might have some programs actually there. But it, it's a beautiful building, and it was not on campus five years ago. And the architects that designed it are incredibly thoughtful and perceptive. They're great listeners. They use computers, but also know what computers are not going to do very well. They forced law school faculty, students, and staff to think hard about what goes where. They got something really symbolic and important to this, I would argue, to this gathering, which is if you go to the law school and go to the, to the heart of that new building, which is the courtyard, you are standing on the foundation of the law school, which is the clinic, actually. The clinic is at the very heart of the law school. And the architects understood that it would be something really special, not only to get the academic faculty and the clinic to be in the same building, but to have the clinic be in that foundational place, in a way, is a reminder that so much of what we do has to be built on a practical understanding of how legal service is delivered. So I say that as an example of how good architects, like the great lawyers who are in this room, can be terrific listeners, innovate, do amazing things, bridge the past and the present. But I also note that architects don't have control of their profession anymore, and most buildings don't actually use architects. So it's, to me, a, a provocative example of what the tension is yeah. when professions try to evolve. Right. So what, is it, what value does the lawyer add that a good computer programmer who knows a little law could do? Empathy. Yeah. A sense of how the world truly feels, maybe, to the person that is about to go through a deposition and is freaked out about it. A sense of what the judges might have been thinking as they made the transition from practicing lawyer, or in my case, law professor, to judge, and a sense of how that might affect how they listen exactly. I, th I think that kind of fuzzy reasoning that comes from that mm -hmm. is harder to duplicate just throwing raw computing power and math at something. Uh, I also feel like uh, there is something about creativity that we haven't yet gotten the hang of how to turn into a computer program. Well, and, and again, to go back to what you said at the beginning, there sounds like there's kind of a triage you have to go through in each instance. Is this something that just technology will work with, or is this something that really takes the human touch, or some combination of the two? Exactly. Yeah. And let me just yeah. say that for, for this group and for bar associations and for the 
state courts that often are in a privity type relationship to bar associations and to supervising professions, it, it's a really quirky problem, this issue of how much do we actually want to encourage either apps or non-lawyers to take on stuff. Because I think hard about the need to police the boundaries of our profession, but honestly, I also think about that you know, 80% of family law litigants that are going out there with no lawyer. And I'm thinking about the landlord-tenant disputes. And so I feel like if we don't have other really great ways of erasing that gap, we have to think about everything in our arsenal mm -hmm. to solve the problem. So last question. Um, we have this great group of people here. We have them, have them here for a day and a half of, of talking with each other and hearing from some pretty uh, uh, accomplished innovators. What would you like to see them do? Well, it sounded to me like our president kind of said that by Monday the problem had to be solved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what I interpreted, at least. That was my kind of statutory interpretation there. I, I, I worry about, um, about the two extremes of either thinking that the problems that we have before us are kind of so intractable that nothing will really change. And by the same token, kind of feeling like, you know what, we've muddled through this for the last however many hundred years that we've had lawyers, it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I, I would urge us to look for that uncomfortable middle between the two, a sense of being really deeply ambitious about what we expect to see, but also pretty serious about the economic and technological and social forces that we have to contend with. You know, Maybe one way to strike that balance a little bit, just one thought experiment, is just imagine you were trying to solve this problem for China or India. Now, number one, that should encourage humility, because like, what do we know about China or India? Mm. I, there are actually a number of people here who know quite a bit, mm. by the way. I, maybe I'm just talking about myself. But the point is, every jurisdiction has its own unique problems. But China and India have serious developmental challenges and massive amounts of concentrated poverty and sheer numbers that we don't have in this country anymore. And I think underscore not only the need for humility about how to understand those societies, but the urgency. And then toggling back and thinking about the US presents us with a set of challenges that are less intractable seeming perhaps, as a way of just thinking that we have a lot at our disposal. Incredible talent is reflected in this room. The fact that notwithstanding all the bad press in the New York Times, a whole bunch of people still want to go to law school. The uh, sense that these new realities that are affecting our profession are also incredible possibilities. They're gonna make law practice potentially incredibly exciting. So I want to see that mix of real concern but also a sense of ambition. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we have time maybe for a few questions. Um, so uh, we have some mobile mics. Got one over here. Yeah. Hello. Um, I'm. I have no law background. I'm just a techno nerd who won a hackathon for legal access. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good for uh, you. We would like to help more, but we don't know where the problems lie. We don't know what we need to do, and and you guys think these problems are way too big to solve. And if you could just clearly state them, we could probably help you solve them a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being here. And never think of yourself as just a non-lawyer, by the way. <laughs> uh, at the end of the day, we're, yeah. we're going to do well by working with you. Yeah. That's what's, in, in fact, in some ways most exciting. I mean, I would say what, what the lawyers in this room are all thinking and smiling about is that Part of this profession exists because problems that seem easy to state turn out to be hard, right? Um, just to kind of mention, well, I could mention any number of examples, but I'll just give you one, right? I mentioned family law a couple times because whatever else I can claim credit for having done before becoming a judge, I did not do family law. And, uh, and Four it is years. A, <laughs> that's why I have good friends. Right? <laughs> but it, it, it's an awe-inspiringly immediate yeah thing because like nothing in the world is more important to the folks who are going through a family law dispute when they're going through it and it's raw and you'll have judges tell you that they might have handled like gang conspiracy cases death penalty cases 
issues involving like $200 million IP disputes, but nothing was as scary for them as being in a family law courtroom with two people whose marriage is falling apart fighting the way that they sometimes will fight. And so I, I mention that because like, okay, you then have a court that has the problem of defining what it means for a family to be living separate and apart. And that seems like a simple inquiry, but it can be awfully complicated. But my point is simply that, that shouldn't stop us from getting a, a community of folks, including some who are both law and computer trained, but also many who are just law trained and just computer trained, sitting down uh, and thinking through what parts of the inquiry can be sort of triaged into some app that can give very basic knowledge and help folks who are going in and they're not legally represented at all, not represented by lawyers, into those courtrooms to not make some very basic mistakes. That, I mean, I think what we could agree on is that a lot of problems that seem easy are easy, and a number of problems that seem easy are actually incredibly hard. And, and I think maybe another thing we could agree on is that people in different professions or in different places in life see the same thing differently. Exactly. And that part of what you're saying is a, a way forward with this dilemma you've been talking about is to get other perspectives, not just the perspective of, of lawyers. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Another question or two? We have one, yeah. Um, So one thing that comes up, um, and I have been doing family law for about uh, 18 months now uh, since uh, since uh, being admitted to practice. Um, one thing that <laughs> that's why you're sitting up front. You knew I was going to say this. <laughs> We're a couple gunners up here. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so, no, one thing that we um, that we come across frequently um, in in our practice is that it seems like a, a great deal, um, a, a great number of the problems that people are dealing with. These, especially folks that otherwise would be pro se, um, you know, but for you know being able to come in and and, and get our services is that a lot of the problems that people seem to think are legal problems are not legal problems. Mm -hmm. And they get so intermeshed and intertwined with other things, um, you know, economic problems, um, you know, uh, mental health issues, mm -hmm. things like that. To what extent uh, do you think there may be an issue with uh, the, perhaps why the problem being so intractable is simply because it's not all a legal mm -hmm. problem? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and you know, it doesn't take more than the one or two death penalty cases to, to make that point in a different way because you see that you know there's a lot needs to be applied but the the way we structure the penalty phase in a proceeding like that you learn a lot about the perpetrator and uh, it's not a pretty picture often uh, all of which is to say that you know there's there, there are some serious disagreements here and I'll channel for a moment refugee and asylum issues because I know them well and I did some cases in this area to kind of show what the, what the disagreements are like. But I think family law is another terrific example of where you see this. It's the role of like the heroic lawyer as thoughtful legal analyst, feisty litigator and social worker versus the conception of a lawyer as a very technically able person who's in some ways akin more to a computer programmer and is gonna be very judicious, and I use the word advisedly, about what the limits of his or her role should be and that view, which you know, maybe doesn't get, you know, there, there's a case to be made for it. And it sounds like this, right? It's like, okay, if you're telling me that huge majorities of people facing life-changing, life-threatening dramas in their lives are not well represented, like who am I to say that what I really should do is to try to be all things to the limited number of people I can help rather than to be really thoughtful and to help you know, leverage technology and good organization to carve out the legal problem and do this thing. Mm -hmm. But again, with the asylum refugee point, well, what I've found to be the case often dealing in my past life with refugee issues, both in at, at times when the issue has been representing asylum seekers in an advanced industrialized country, but also going to developing countries and dealing with the big mass influx emergencies they have where there are thousands and thousands of people coming in at once fleeing conflict, is that it's just awfully, awfully hard to operationalize this idea that you're gonna try to like take a cotton gin and pull out the legal because that's not the way people actually experience their lives. And you know, I'll just note that the question I have about that is, I used the word empathy before to talk about what a good lawyer might do with a client in doing the stuff that even a really good computer program 14 years from now might not be able to do. 
And I think it is about not being quite so scalpel-like with that mm -hmm. distinction. Mm -hmm. And although I have not myself practiced business law like in a big law firm, my guess would be that it's kind of not so different for the really sophisticated, incredibly good like advisor to captains of industry who's like, you know what, all right, this will solve your legal problem, but uh, you know, you might have a certain set of economic or, or public relations challenges you'll have to deal with. Yeah, and I think that's, ex I mean, I, I was a mental health lawyer and most of the things my clients wanted were things I couldn't get. You know, they, they had, uh, some of them were delusional and they, the, things they wanted me to achieve in court were not things that any court would, would be able to give. But there were other things I could do for them. You know, I could look and see what was going on with their housing situation or their care situation and maybe, maybe getting some resources into that would improve the situation and their delusions wouldn't be as painful. You know, and so, so it's the, the problem identification, the, the triage, and the, what, what, what are we as lawyers good at? What should we bring in other people or other perspectives to help us do? Um, I think that's, it's, it's a multifaceted view of practice that, that may, may have some promise. Um, it's six o'clock, it's time to have a party. Would you please join me in thanking Justice Cuellar. <laughs>